I'm a social scientist, um, which means I study society and social relationships. For the last couple of years, I've been engaged in a program of research looking at how a whole variety of people understand, engage with, and think about the brain. So about scientists, a range of professionals, including clergy, counsellors, uh, and a variety of patient groups as well. In this talk today, I'm going to be talking around the idea of the specialness of the brain. Now, I'm not going to give you an answer to this question, the title, just how special is the brain. Rather, what I'm going to try and do is present you some, some findings from my work and kind of let you figure out this question for yourselves. Okay, so today, neuroscience and study of the brain is increasingly seen as vitally important. It's, the brain is taken to be the locus of personhood. Um, neuroscience is seen as being able to, to tell us something important about who we are, um, and how to generate new therapies for a range of disorders, including a variety of mental illnesses. At the same time, the brain's entered into consumer culture as well, right? So I'm sure many of you are familiar with these brain training software, um, the, the little games that like Nintendo and such like did. So you can see then that the brain has become an object of consumerism as well as an object of research. Now, these kinds of claims and social practices are predicated on the idea that the brain is the seat of personhood, right? It's it's the thing that makes you, you. But at the same time, these practices help reinforce the claims. Now having said that, the brain hasn't always been seen as important. Now, historian Fernando Vidal has really studied this change quite, quite depthly, this idea that the brain is you. And he's found that it's kind of risen sort of in the 17th century within Europe. Prior to that, the brain wasn't necessarily seen as the key attribute of person, but it was, it was another organ, if you like. Perhaps a heart was more important in some occasions. Now, at the same time that this was happening, it wasn't happening just in Europe. It was happening kind of in other places too, but not everywhere. And indeed today, the brain isn't always seen as the very seat of who you are. Um, anthropologist Margaret Locke, for instance, has studied uh, the idea of brain death in Japan. And Brain death is not necessarily equated with the death of you as an individual, and as a consequence of that, uh, transplantation of, of individuals with brain dead bodies is sometimes a bit questionable. And in fact, this very idea of brain death is reasonably modern. It only kind of really became concretized in the mid 20th century, uh, partly as a consequence of the development of new technologies that helped to, to show when brains were dead, if you like. So in my research, what's become very clear is that a variety of people hold a number of diverse views about the brain. At the same time, these diverse views are sometimes internally incoherent and inconsistent. So one person may start off telling me about the brain and sort of say how important it is, how vital it is to research. And then towards the end of the, the tale that they're telling me, they'll start to say, well, you know, it's just a lump of flesh. It's just something that laboratory scientists can use to do their work. Now, these ambivalent narratives, as we might call them, um, they're not just restricted to people outside the world of neuroscience, people who, who don't work in the lab or people who don't have neurological conditions. We see the same kinds of narratives emerge from scientists and from a range of patient groups. And in fact, some of the greatest ambivalences can come from So, what do I want to get across here? This, this notion that the brain is, is significant and it's mundane, it's, it's both, right? It's not a question of which is it, it's more of a question of when is it. So at different times and in different locations, the brain might sometimes be seen as significant, sometimes seen as mundane. And that, that leads us to, to kind of think a bit differently about is the brain special? As a consequence of that, this raises new challenges in some ways for ideas about brain donation. So maybe after hearing the really interesting talks from the scientists, many people here are very, like, very eager to donate their brains. They think it's great, they think this kind of research should go ahead. And maybe that's actually very different to what they thought 10 minutes ago, prior to the talks. 
but maybe as well it's different in turn to what they'll think in 10 minutes time when everyone here um, decides to talk to their family and friends about what they've heard today. So as a consequence of what we've heard then and the, the kinds of research I've done, I'm really reluctant to answer this question, how special is the brain? And the reason for that is because it depends, right? As with so many things. So I'm not going to tell you that the brain is special. I'm also not going to tell you that it isn't. What I am going to do is ask you to really engage me with this question on your own and think, why do I feel the way I do? In what ways is it related to the information I've heard today? In what ways does it relate to the experiences I've had and the kinds of things I or maybe read on the bus, right? So I'm sure many people here today have clicked through the metro on the way here. Was there something about the brain in there, right? And how has that made you think about your attitudes to all this? Is the brain special? You decide. Thank you.